I'm sure the regular listeners have noticed the new intro music and may wonder if they have the right podcast. I assure you that this is the Busy Latter-day Saint podcast, and I offer a hearty welcome. This is where righteous desires and living life come together. Here, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints discuss their challenges and successes in studying the scriptures. I'm your host, Richard Bernard. Please give this podcast a thumbs up and tap on the subscribe button. Your thumbs up and subscription increases the show's ratings, thus making it easier for people to find. If you have any comments or would like to be a guest on the podcast, feel free to email me. Additionally, if you have someone in mind who would make a great guest, please let me know. To receive updates on the Gospel Library and news about the podcast, be sure to add your email to my website. I only send emails once a week, and rest assured that your email will not be sold. Links to my email and website are now in the show notes. Today's guest is Angie Gillian, well-known composer and author. Angie has over 10 million subscribers to her YouTube channel, Angie Gillian Music, and there's a reason. Her music is spiritually uplifting and appeals to all age groups. If you have primary children, I'm sure you've heard her music. Angie was a delightful guest, and I enjoyed hearing about her music and her work in producing the videos. You'll get a behind-the-scenes view of how she produces the videos and hear about working with a cast of children and youth. Angie has had her challenges. She talks about her postpartum depression and how music and her covenant with the Lord helped her to overcome the disabling affliction. You're going to love hearing about her life and her desire to help others draw to Christ. Now, here's Angie. Angie, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I am so good. How are you? I'm I'm wonderful, and I've been uh, looking forward to speaking to you because we're both musicians and we're both composers. So I'm going to have a lot of little questions for you because I want the audience to know what goes into composing music. And, and, and yeah, then I've, we could talk about that all day, couldn't we? <laughs> yes, and of course we've got the technical side. What software are you using? So anyway, we'll get we'll get into that. Let's start with you. I see from your website there's a beautiful family here. I assume that's your family. It is. <laughs> it shows three children. Is that still the same? I chose three children. You're right. Okay. <laughs> and so it looks like you have two boys and a girl. Yep. And my little girl is our little sandwich right in the middle. Okay. She's in the middle. So what are the ages? They, well, as of tomorrow, they are six, eight, and 10. They're the perfect ages, and I would like to freeze them there forever. <laughs> <laughs> They're so much fun. They still snuggle, and they are happy and pretty obedient and they think my music's cool still so if we could just freeze time here i would uh i would really enjoy that they're they're so much fun unfortunately you've got adventures ahead for you as they hit i know head into their teen years <laughs> yeah we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get there but for now i am just enjoying them so much they are so much fun and at the teenagers, they feel that they understand a lot more about life than you do. Yep. And then they, they grow up and they realize that really we understand <laughs> nothing, right? <laughs> well, we could only have the confidence of a 17-year-old. Yeah. We'd all be in a... Well, I'm sure you were... I'm sure you were a perfect teenager. Nearly. Not quite, <laughs> but nearly. <laughs> so... All right, well, you are a composer and a um, author, but education-wise, where did you go to school? I went to BYU. This is an interesting story. Um, I was a math education major, actually, and thought I wanted to teach math. Um, I wanted to teach calculus, AP calculus, things like that, and I got to my student teaching and well, I guess it wasn't quite like the actual student teaching. It was a semester before when we were going to a lot of different classrooms every week. And 
realized I really loved math, but I really did not want to teach children, teenagers, math. <laughs> and at the same time, my husband um, started this really accelerated nursing program and was unable to work through that. So I said, I'll take a break. I will work full time. So I worked at a pharmacy. I taught piano lessons. I did bookkeeping. I did a lot of different things. I tutored. And um, as soon as he was done with school, we ended up getting pregnant and I started having babies and I've never gone back to school. So my music education, I'm mostly a self-taught composer. Um, I In high school, I guess I took AP music and that I guess that you could call that my, my music education background. Um, but yep, I am living proof of what <laughs> Heavenly Father can do with his imperfect children when they allow themselves to become instruments in his masterful hands. And I will just say that I have put in a lot of hours, just not in a traditional school setting for, for music at least. Well, now did you finish at BYU? No, so I should go back and finish. Um, but at this point, I don't know that I will, at least at least when my kids are young. There just hasn't been a good time to go back um, after I started having babies. And yeah, there's no way I could with a six, eight and 10 year old right now. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Okay, well, let's get into music. Uh, you say you were self-taught, what did you do? Uh, lots of trial and error. Um, lots of private lessons with um, Shane Mickelson. I don't know if you know Shane, but he's a, a brilliant composer and a dear friend. Um, he told me recently that I was like a sister to him. So that was a pretty great compliment. But um, so, yeah, just a lot of studying other other pieces of music and playing with things and getting feedback. And um, that I, that's really all it's come down to. <laughs> Now, did you do your own orchestration on these pieces? No, I don't do the orchestration. I do most of my own piano arrangements, um, but not not necessarily the, I don't do the orchestration. Who is doing that? Um, so either Shane Mickelson or Daniel Blomberg. They do a lot of arranging and orchestration for me. Okay. And I'm sure the audience is not interested, but I am. So what software do you use? I use Dorico. Dorico. It's kind of the, the new kid on the block. Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with it. Okay. Yeah, it's um, very great. Um, I really like it. And that's, that's, what Shane, that's what Shane uses. He was the one who pulled me over to Dorico, and I've never looked back. It's, it's so user-friendly and very intuitive and... It makes beautiful sheet music, so I like it a lot. Were you using Notion before that, or what were you using? No, um, when I started, I was actually using MuseScore, which is like an open source program, and it has some limitations, and um, Shane pulled me over to Dorico. Um, so I never, I know a lot of people use Finale and Sibelius and things like that. I never got into those two, but Dorico is great. And I wish I had, I wish I had like a, one of those free codes. They're not free codes, but like a, a discount code attached to my name. Cause I tell so many people how much I love the program. And now all of my friends use it. So <laughs> it's pretty wonderful. And there's another one called staff pad. Now, do you use an iPad? What are you using? No, I use my, my MacBook pro. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, it's actually pretty comical. I, I open it up as far as I can, and then I prop it up on my piano. Um, my music office is in like the process of of happening. So for right now, I I prop my iPad up on my or not my iPad, my my laptop up on my piano, and I play and then notate by hand, and it's it's an exhausting process. Okay. But that's what I do. So you're not set up with a MIDI or anything to play and no, have it record? No, no, I like I like the way I do it, but I probably will start doing that as soon as my my music office is done. I don't think people are going to be interested in listening to me talk about that, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes I'm, I'm selfish and I uh, talk about the things I want to talk about. And that's so. okay. You have every right to do that. <laughs> so uh, uh, we were... Um, when I was talking with um, Laurie Denning yesterday, we, we got 
a little carried away with something that was, I'm sure, only of interest to the two of us, but that's what <laughs> happens. So, well, what I'd like to do is for people to get an understanding. How does this all begin? For example, um, you have um, Always Remember. In fact, I first heard that when I was um, in primary a few months ago and interpreting for a deaf child. And um, oh. I had, had not heard the music. And of course, I have a hearing loss, so I can't hear words when there's music. <laughs> and so someone had to give me the sheet music so that I could interpret it. But um, I was very impressed by the music. So how did that begin? So Always Remember is my daughter's baptism song. I, I wrote my son the baptism song. It's called Step by Step. It's very adorable. And as my daughter was approaching the age of baptism, I mean, she just turned eight on Sunday. So we're not even quite to her baptism. But I just kept thinking, what in the world am I going to write about for her baptism? Step by Step is honestly the most perfect baptism song. And it's it's just hard to go that, that route again. And um, I was part of the sacrament prayers have always stood out to me and it's it's the covenant that we make to always remember our savior and i somehow the thought popped into my mind just thinking i mean this was during sacramenting just thinking about that promise that we make and thinking about his sacrifice and his deep connection with every one of us and the thought came to my mind i will always remember him he will always remember me and and i said well there it is there's the song we have to write the song about that so that's that's kind of how that started and then for the chorus i just kept thinking what is it that i want my children to always remember about their savior what are those things that i want to play through their mind as they take the sacrament and so the chorus says i will always remember that jesus loves me that's number one that he lived died and rose again to set the whole world free number two he will bless me with his spirit and fill my soul with peace, number three. And then taking it all back together, I will always remember him. He will always remember me. And the verses, um, I wanted to talk about the atonement and Gethsemane in the verses, but I also wanted to introduce the song in a very childlike way. So when I told you that I study the scriptures differently, I study with the intent to turn them into lyrics. <laughs> so that's kind of how I write. So the beginning of the song was actually taken from Mark 10, 13 through 16. And it says, and they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked them, rebuked those who brought them. And when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms and he and put his hands upon them and blessed them. So verse one says, let the little children come to me, the Savior gently said, then taking them into his arms, laid hands upon their heads. So when I read the scriptures and study the scriptures, I'm really doing it in a way that I can transform those things into something that a child can can visualize and understand and put to music in a meaningful way. So there you go. <laughs> All right. That's kind of how Always Remember came to be. Well, do you work on the lyrics first and then add music or do you do it at the same time? What's the process? You know, it's different with every song. And I don't I don't know if it's like that for everyone, but sometimes it's the music that will come first or some kind of a, a chord progression or a melody or and sometimes sometimes the words and the music come at the same time and that's I always feel like that's the more magical experience when you feel like the words and the music were really just made to be together you're not forcing anything you're not having to alternate things to to make it fit writing music is what you probably understand it's like a giant puzzle that you don't have the map for <laughs> and and sometimes fitting all those pieces to work together with the lyrics and the music it can be a struggle, um, but at the end, it's always really great when it comes together perfectly. Angie, what I'd like to do now is play a little segment of Always Remember, and then we'll discuss it. Let the little children come, the Savior gently said.
All right, well, Angie, we've just heard a little bit of a piece of that um, Always Remember. And what, what goes through your mind as you listen to it? Ooh, you know what? For me, this song is all about those last two lines of the chorus. I will always remember him. He will always remember me. And the other thing that goes through my mind is just how proud I am of my little my little seven-year-old. She was seven when she recorded that song. And her voice is just so precious to me. And I love being able to capture my children's voices at different points in their life. And they really, they really take ownership of these songs. Like she'll tell you that's her song. It's her favorite song. And it, that means a lot to me as a mother. My, my goal, when I started writing music, I, I've been writing for about seven years. And my original goal was to write songs to teach my children about the lo light and love of their savior and his gospel. And that this song really encompasses to me, it really just encompasses what our gospel is all about. And yeah, I love this song. I hope you love it too. Well, I do. I, um, of course, I always listen to music on a different um, perspective, having played professionally for a number of years and, and, um, and having written music. But I love the chord progressions. I love the words and and the melody, it's, it's, it's a beautiful melody. I did wonder if that girl in the beginning was your daughter. She is. <laughs> and it is. Now, where did you get all these other children in mm. the video? Um, a lot of them are, are my friend's children. Um, some of them. Some of them were strangers to me. I sometimes I, I just write a post on Facebook saying I'm filming a music video. I need a few more boys. And that's what it was for this one. I needed some more boys. I had a lot of girls. I usually have a lot of girls who are very eager to be in music videos and not as many boys. And uh, I got more than enough. We'll just say that <laughs> we, we had a lot of children who wanted to come and participate. And it was just it was just lovely. And the actor, I mean, if you watch the video, the actor is actually a man who lives in California and he flew out to, his name is Marshall Shackro, and he flew out to portray Jesus in this video. And it was so tender to watch him interact with the children. And I just, it just made me so happy. It was a very special experience. In fact, I'm gonna tell you something that you can't really see on the video because it wasn't included. But at the end of the shoot, we were losing this, we were losing sunlight so quickly. And I had really wanted to have the children form a big circle around Marshall, um, just because a circle is eternal, it never stops. And, and the bridge says, always, always, he'll remember me, always, always, he'll remember me. And we, the sun had just set and I was so sad that we didn't get this shot. But <laughs> in, in the wake of the sunset, there was this gorgeous blue light that we still had and we had maybe maybe 10 minutes of of time where we would still have this soft blue light we could film and marshall was actually on we, we were down this very rocky i mean boulder sized rocky embankment down on the shore and marshall was up on top by the parking lot um filming footage for a come follow me mashup video that we were we were crazy we were filming two videos at the same time it was kind of a nuts day and we called him, we called him on the cell phone and we were like, can you get here? And he was like, yes, I will, I will be there. So he starts running down this, this rocky, there was no, not even a path, just boulder sagebrush, boulder sagebrush, right? He's like hopping from rock to rock with his, his little, uh, his, uh, his Jesus looking sandals. They were just, you know, just barely there sandals and after you get down the rocky part, there was a little bit of sand and then there was, um, we were at the Great Salt Lake, so the, the shore is covered in salt crystals and they're very, very sharp. Um, and he was having a hard time running in his flip flops, so he took his shoes off and he started running across the, this salty, crusted, very sharp, very painful um, sandy salty sand um crusty stuff whatever this was um left over from the lake because the lake had been receding right and um and i didn't know that he had done that i didn't know he had taken his his shoes off 
Um, but we have this video footage from a, a drone up above that just shows him running arms open wide across across this shore. And it really, um, it really just hit home for me because the word sucker, I'm kind of a word person. I think most people who write lyrics are, are kind of word people, but the word sucker doesn't mean comfort or help, right? It doesn't just mean that it means to run to and provide aid. And that, that was what Marshall did. And it, it was just this really powerful visual for me. Um, and especially knowing later that he took off his, his shoes and his feet were in a lot of pain to get to us so quickly. So yeah, I learned, I learned a lot that day and it was, it was very powerful and just such a beautiful experience. So thanks for, thanks for letting me share that story. Well, I am, thank you for the story. It's always very nice to have greater insight, which brings me to the production crew. Obviously they were very professional. Where did you find them? Did you pay them? It was this volunteer work. No, I, I pay everyone. I pay the musicians who recorded the orchestra. I, I pay my videographer. Um, the only people I don't pay are, are the children who show up for the videos. So, okay. yeah. In fact, I even paid a friend to help me kind of storyboard this one because I, I just felt like I was so overwhelmed at the time. But between the two videos, I so I paid my friend Elena to kind of help map the video out. So. It starts in it starts in the room and it starts kind of in Janie's imagination and then at the end it transports mm -hmm. back. So that's that's kind of how it all works together. But yeah, my friend Elena helped me with that. She was she was great. So fun to work with. Angie, the next one I'd like to talk about is Ready to Rise. So let's listen to that and then I'll get your comments. Where can I turn? When I feel alone, lost in the crowd Where I should belong Where do I belong? Steady my faith When others walk away Give me your strength When I feel afraid I don't have to be afraid So Angie, what can you share with us about this music? Ready to Rise is honestly, probably my favorite song that I've written in a long time. This song is just so special on how it came together and ev everything that went into this song was just, it just came together so perfectly. I wrote this song with three of my really good friends, um, James and Chelsea Stevens and Joelle Enerson, who lives up in Rexburg, and we wrote this song over Zoom. One of the the people people wonder how we write songs, all four of us together at the same time. Um, and this one, uh, we 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 go on Zoom and we pull up a Google document, and we're all on the Google document, and we're all typing at the same time, and we write lines and lines and lines, and uh, decide where we want things. And with this one, we kind of wrote with a melody in mind. So Joelle, um, she's going to, sh well, she probably won't hate that I say this, but my joke with Joelle is that I push play on Joelle and she sings a melody and that's what we write to. So I, I literally pretend with my finger to push play on the screen and she laughs, but um, that's <laughs> that's what we do. Um, and this this group is really special to write with because we're, I, I won't say it's me, but when we're together, when we write together, and we're writing a song for for the Lord, right? We we pray before we start, before every time we start a new session. And one of the things that impressed me in this song is every time we would write, we would pray that we would find lyrics 
that would connect with the youth that would pull them through hard things that they were going through that they would be the words that the Lord wanted them to hear. And it was really interesting because after this song was finished, uh, I had a an experience. Um, <laughs> one of the lines in the song says, steady my faith when others walk away. And right before we filmed the video, um, two people that are very dear to me uh, told us, told me and my husband that they were leaving the church, that they didn't believe it was true. And um, we were heartbroken. We were very, very sad. Uh, these were people that for a while we thought were going to raise our children if we ever passed away. So they were very, very close to us. They are very close to us still. And it was a really difficult thing for me. And throughout that, throughout that couple of weeks up until we filmed the video, and then and then even after that, those words played through my mind like a broken record. <laughs> Steady my faith when others walk away, just on a constant loop. And brought me a lot of comfort because we, I mean, we were, we prayed that we would, uh, you know, come up with these lyrics that the youth needed, but Heavenly Father knew that I would need those lyrics. He knew that I would need those lyrics to pull me through a really, really hard time. So I'm, I'm grateful that we, we have a God who can see the end from the beginning and he knows our needs even before we do. That was a really special experience for me. But that, that video in particular was really fun because we actually went down to St. George to film it. And we had kids come from Idaho, Utah County, um, Las Vegas, and St. George areas. And we had about 35 children, children, not children, teenagers, youth, young people. And the night before we got together, because we didn't know a lot of them. A lot of them were kids from St. George that that we didn't know and I didn't know most of the kids anyway because they were mostly nieces and nephews of the songwriters right but none of none of mine because mine are all younger than that mostly and um we we did this this like fireside with this group of young people and just tried to break the ice so that in the morning when we went to film they would already feel comfortable with us and with each other and we got up the next morning some of them didn't sleep the night before they were having too much fun all together in the condo uh, the ones that were that we brought down and had to stay together and we got to the location it was still completely pitch black we had our flashlights out and we we hiked up onto the rocks and found the places we were going to film and film this video there and it just turned out so beautiful it's it, it's just such a special song and yeah that's that's when i feel pretty privileged to be a part of that was a really really incredible experience I don't think most people, unless they've experienced it, um, what it takes to just film something like this. It's not, okay, we're going to do it once and we're done. <laughs> and there's Those all... are like a hundred. Like yes. times up by a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and it becomes a long day and everyone's standing. <laughs> and, and, and now I'm still amazed. Where did the, all these kids stay? So we had, a, I don't know how many actually stayed. Joel has a condo down there. So a lot of them stayed there. All of, most of them were friends and nieces and nephews and the vocalists that we brought down from Utah County and Salt Lake County. And then um, the ones from St. George stayed at their own houses. A few of them who had parents there stayed in, I don't know, Airbnbs and hotels. I don't know. And it was a, it was a big group though at Joel's house. That was a... I mean, they were pretty crammed in there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the other question comes about, these are teenagers. Food. <laughs> yeah, we we provided all of the food and put all of that into our budget for the song. And just this, this is a song we will never recoup our investment on, but it, we know it was just such a, a worthwhile experience. And we just had so much fun. It was, it was great. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Well, when I watch the video, it looks like, yes, everyone's enjoying themselves, and it's, it's a great message. Well, let's turn to the scriptures. Now, um, when I was um, 
asking you to be a part of this podcast and what it was about. You go, well, I, I'm not the normal person for studying the scriptures or something to that effect. And I said, that doesn't matter because <laughs> everybody's different. So when you study the scriptures, what, what do you do? I study the scriptures looking for inspiration to write music. That's kind of what it comes down to. Um, I, I may have mentioned, I don't know if it'll get cut out or not, that it, it's kind of a manic studying. But when I'm in the middle of, of writing, when I feel prompted to write a song about something, then it's it's a deep dive into whatever that topic is. And so and sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes I'll I'll stumble upon a scripture in my just my normal study or in church or something like that. Or I don't know, I don't know how it all comes together, but I'll feel very like impressed by a certain scripture and decide to write about that. So I have a I have a lot of music that no one's ever heard that has come strictly inspired by something that I read and something that you know st stood out to me and was really impactful for me and if that's okay is it okay if i share um a poem i i, I there is music but it hasn't ever been shared yes and um, would that be okay yes okay so one of one of the scriptures that really spoke to me as a, as a musician is uh it's matthew 26 30 and it's a scripture that i had probably read a million times and one time when I was reading it, it really just kind of kind of caught me as a as a musician and as a composer. It says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. So at, at the end of Passover, after the washing of feet and partaking of the, the, the emblems of the Passover and the sacraments and all of those things, the last thing that Jesus did before he went to Gethsemane was he sang a hymn with his with his followers. And that really just touched me because music is such a big part of my life. And I started wondering like, what is it that they would have sung? And after doing some digging, I realized that at the end of Passover in, in now and back then, they sing what's called the Hallel. And at the beginning and the end of this, of the Hallel, it says, it says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. And I was so touched by that, that that was, that may have been the words that were sung right before Jesus went to Gethsemane. So I reached out to my friend, Michael D. Young, and he is a, a lyricist, a really brilliant hymn text writer. Um, in fact, I think he's written a hymn text for every chapter of the Book of Mormon. And you, uh, you should talk to him. This would be right up your alley. He's, he's a very amazing person and a great, good, great, good friend of mine, just a really great friend. And I asked him if he would want to write a, a hymn text with me. And he graciously agreed as he always does. He's so nice. And we got working together. And this is this is the hymn that we wrote. Surrounded in the upper room by dearest friends and sacred signs, the Savior blessed and broke the bread and passed to each the cup of wine. The air hung heavy as they sat, and while the dying sun grew dim, with fervent hearts their, verses, their voices joined in offering a solemn hymn. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Oh, give thanks, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever, for his mercy endures forever. Within the grove of gnarled trees, he fell upon his face and pled, and with scarlet sweat that stained the earth, the sun partook the cup and bled. Beneath the press of agony, the world's weight of sin and grief, did solemn songs of reverence lend a sip of solace and relief. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he, oh, give thanks, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever, for his mercy endures forever. Upon the cruel cross of shame, forsaken in his final hour, the Savior did not stop his pain, although he surely had the power. As he fulfilled his final task to reconcile each precious one, did songs of faith help him to bear his sacred duty as God's son? Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Oh, give thanks for he is good, for his mercy endures forever, for his mercy endures forever. Each week before I eat the bread and water, honoring that night, I have the chance to sing a hymn as he to fill my soul with light, renewing sacred covenants through him who died to set me free, May hymns of hope direct my thoughts, inviting him to walk with me. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Oh, give thanks for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. For his mercy endures forever. That's beautiful. Now, did you put music to that? 
Um, we didn't, but Dan Carter did. I don't know if you know Dan, but he, uh, you probably know his music if you don't know him. We've never shared it though. We have, I just, I just have a PDF. We don't have a recording or anything, but we probably should. We should probably make that one available. It's a beautiful hymn. So that's how you study the scriptures. You're looking for inspiration. How does all of this draw you closer to the Savior? It's all about the Savior. <laughs> um, so, so seven years ago, this is a part of my story that I haven't shared with you. When I started writing music, I was actually in the midst of postpartum depression. I was really struggling with myself and my worth and my my roles as a mother. My children were two and zero, <laughs> two and probably like eight months old. So I was kind of in the in the mm, the tough, long, long days and long nights. And it was a really hard place for me. I there was one time in particular that my husband, who was one of the only people who knew how much I was struggling, he said, why don't you feed the baby and I will take the baby and the toddler to my mom's house for two hours and you can do anything you want to do. Anything you want to do, you can do. And then I'll come back so you can feed the baby again. She was, uh, we, called, we called her Beastie when she was little because she growled and because she ate every two hours around the clock. <laughs> she was, it was pretty rough. That year was a really hard one. And he took the baby and I sat on the couch and I thought to myself, what am I going to do for two hours? And uh, I didn't do laundry and I didn't fold the clothes or wash the dishes or vacuum the house, all of these things that really needed to be on. I, I could have taken a nap. I could have showered. All of those things would have been great and worthwhile and important. But instead, I sat there and stared at the wall for two hours because I thought anything I did for myself was not worth it because my worth was, I wasn't, I wasn't worth it. So that's kind of where I was when one night I was singing to Little Beastie, taking, trying to put her back to sleep. And a melody popped in my mind that I didn't recognize, and I paired it with some simple words about the sunset. And uh, I sang a song to Little Beastie, my cute little baby who I love so much. And it it kind of split this like spark inside of me, something that I didn't really know was there. And I wanted to feel that all the time. And I so I set my goal, like I said, to write songs for my children about the light and love of their savior. So I started writing these songs and they weren't really great, but I was writing them for my kids and I made a promise with Heavenly Father. I made a covenant with him and the covenant, the prayer said exactly this. If you will send me music, I will write it down and I will share it with the world. And after that, I, I really just started being, I wouldn't say bombarded, but it started flowing. And sometimes it's a trickle and sometimes it's a river. And it kind of depends on where we're at in our life. Um, but it's all about, it's all about the Savior. It's all about praising him and spreading his light, his love, his message, and reaching people across the, the entire world. And I've been incredibly blessed in my efforts. Um, I feel like he's added upon me, uh, added talent to me that I, that I didn't have before. I feel like he has opened doors and made connections in my life that have enabled me to become this instrument that I strive to be. And the scriptures are really the center of, of each of the, each message in, in my songs. It's all, I, I have a list of scriptures actually for each, each song that I pull from when I write and that inspire me. And in fact, it was kind of interesting because my most famous song is my own sacred grove, but I was, I, I do a lot of reading on the computer and on my phone, you know, we're, we live in this digital age. So a lot of my study is on, on those things. But a few years ago, after I had released this song, I opened up my scriptures that I was given when I was, I was probably a young teenager. And it's the scriptures that I used in seminary and that I used at BYU and things like that. And I opened up my scriptures to Joseph Smith history because I was preparing for a devotional that I was going to give to on Zoom to a group in California. And I opened up my scriptures and I noticed that in the margins of uh, Joseph Smith history 114, um, which is where Joseph Smith says that he um, he retired to the woods to make his attempt to pray. And 
I had written in my 16 year old handwriting, find your own sacred grove. New York is too far away. Mm. <laughs> and it, that, that really meant so much to me because I don't remember writing it. Um, but that song has, has uh, taken such a, a hold on my life and um, my story. And I didn't realize it had started when I was 15 or 16 years old. Um, that's a song that came, words and melody. I told you that that's when it's the most special. And that came at a time in my life where I didn't believe I was capable of writing such a song. Um, I was pregnant with that third little boy, <laughs> my, my, little, my little squish who is um, turning six tomorrow. And when I was told pretty, it was pretty uh, apparent that Heavenly Father wanted me to write a song called, I will find my own sacred grove. And I kind of told him, no, I kind of said, I can't do this right now. I'm exhausted. I'm pregnant. I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old and I'm trying, you know, getting ready to give birth to this little baby. And I just feel so tired. I just don't think I can do it. And the next day I start hearing in my, start hearing in my mind, the chorus of that song, it came the first line over and over and over again. And then with the second line over and over and over again. And then the third line over and over and over again. And then the last line. And I still told Heavenly Father, like, you know, that's beautiful. And I just can't do it. Can we do it later? Can, you know, can I wait till the baby's here? Can I wait until he's potty trained or he's in uh, sleeping through the night? Can I wait till he's in preschool? You know, I was like making all of these, like, <laughs> you know, counter offers with Heavenly Father, which is, which is not great. I don't recommend doing that. Um, but the next day I started hearing these booming minor chords. So if you listen to this song, you're a musician, so you should hear them. Big booming minor chords, major chords. Anyway, big booming, which I was surprised to hear. And then the next day I started hearing this, this twinkling in the piano, which becomes, it became the piano hook um, that you'll hear at the beginning of the song. You'll hear it in the interludes. You'll hear it during the chorus. And that was the day where I realized that I could not write the song. There was no way I could write the song, but I realized that with Heavenly Father's help, I could do anything that he wanted me to do. It was kind of my um, my Nephi moment where I, you know, if you give me the tools, if you tell me how to do, build this ship, I've never built a ship before, but I will build it for you and I will do, I will sail anywhere you want me to. And uh, the song was finished about three days after that day. And I'm I'm just so grateful for how much trust God has put in me. And I don't, I don't even know. I get a lot of, I get a lot of budding composers who reach out to me and they, they ask, you know, how did you start? How did you do this? And it really all comes down to relying on heavenly father and trusting in him, listening to the spirit and doing everything you can to learn, to grow and to push his work forward. Yes. It's, Yes. Become I, my entire life. So. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. Well, Angie, I've appreciated the time with you, and I, I know that um, people <laughs> that are listening to this don't know that some of your children have come in and demanding your attention while we've been recording this. <laughs> Just and three a, times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we had to start over a few times, but that's okay. So, and... Um, in our emails, um, you said that you've got a pretty tight schedule, and I don't want to keep you longer than promised. And also, as you can see, my audience doesn't know I'm dressed, and my wife's waiting downstairs so that we can head to the temple. So I would like, if you don't mind, to please share your testimony. I would love to. I will never pass up an opportunity to share my love for Jesus Christ. I know he's my savior. I know he lives. I, I know that God hears and answers my prayers. Um, I know that because, because he does, he does hear me. He does send me answers sometimes through other people, sometimes through miracles. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed that it won't rain <laughs> because we have a video scheduled and I have literally seen the clouds open. Um, because of prayers that we've made. In fact, one, one experience that's very special to me, I was filming a song, a video for a song called 
I am thankful. And it's the cutest little Thanksgiving song that you have maybe never heard. Maybe you have. And uh, we, the day before we filmed, we checked the weather and it was bad. So we moved the location. We thought, okay, maybe we'll be okay. And as we were driving up the canyon, we started noticing that the clouds were turning gray and kind of filling in above us. And we worried, we kind of panicked, we got up there and it started raining. <laughs> so we prayed again and um, we had the children hold these little chalkboard signs that said things that they were thankful for on the chalkboard signs. And we hurried and tried to get those filmed before, it, you know, in case it got worse. So the kids were holding these chalkboard signs and the last chalkboard sign said, sunshine and this little girl was grateful for sunshine and we looked up and looked around and thought where could we possibly put this little girl that won't look ridiculous <laughs> because it was very much gray stormy very dreary looking so we found one tiny little sliver of blue on the horizon and we put her in front of that she was holding her chalkboard sign and out from the clouds a circle emerged right around the sun a small circle and it shined directly on this little girl. And as soon as we were done filming it, the circle literally collapsed back in on itself. I know that God is involved in the, the very details of our lives. I know that if it's important to us, it's important to him. I know that he can take our widow's might and cher and he cherishes it. I know that he can magnify our efforts. I know that he can fill our nets with people who are searching for the truth. I am so grateful for his gospel and for the blessings that it brings to my life and to my family. And I would love to close in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.